Hey y'all. New day, new verse. Let's finish off Romans 14, verses 22 through 23. Here we go. Cultivate your own relationship with God, but don't impose it on others. You're fortunate if your behavior and your belief are coherent. But if you're not sure, if you notice that you're acting in ways inconsistent with what you believe, some days trying to impose your opinion on others, other days just trying to please them, then you know you're out of line. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, it's wrong. And you know, then it's wrong. And I was thinking about this a bit, thinking about what it looks like to cultivate one's relationship and not imposing. Because there are three kind of ideas that are three key ideas that seem to kind of flow through here. Imposing one's relationship on others, imposing opinions, and appeasement. When we have a relationship with God, when we cultivate it, when we move in with Him, He shows us a different way of living. He will show what it looks like to live in love, a type of behavior that I really do believe is inborn to humanity we just spend most of our life trying not to do it. That, well, maybe it's not right to hurt others. The, those kind of questions. That morality that is seemingly deeper. The thing that says, well, that's right or that's wrong. That we can't quite quantify or qualify. But it's something there. Cultivating that relationship, but not imposing it on others. And I, and I think in... in certain communities, it's something that needs to be reiterated a fair bit. I know in my youth I be, used to be a bit of a Bible thumper. I didn't really have an interest in sharing the Word as much as sharing my own opinion. And I've come to realize that, well, everyone has an opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. Don't let anyone force it upon you, and certainly don't force it upon anyone else. Because the moment we try to force what we feel, think, or want on another person, we're almost saying that whatever it is about them that we disagree with isn't acceptable or right. We cast them out because they're different or other, or because they might not look the way we want them to look. Seems rather messed up, doesn't it? I find it curious, especially since, you know, how can one say they follow the God who made everyone and loves all of us and died for us, but throw people out because they're slightly different? That seems a type of imposing one's opinion and behavior that seems quite, well, counter to what's in the Word. So as we develop the relationship, our lives should be the evangelistic tool. So we see throughout all the Bible, especially in Acts, that when the disciples are sharing who God is, like Peter with the centurion, or Paul throughout his travels, Paul would start out by going to the Jewish synagogues, Jewish Messiah, and talk about how Christ is the fulfillment of those, how Jesus is the fulfillment of those, Yeshua. If they didn't want to listen, he'd go to the Gentiles. Say, look, we all know that actions have consequences. Why not have things set right? And if somebody thought Paul was out of his gourd, which often happened, he didn't condemn them. In truth, even when he was on trial before the High Council of the Jewish Sanhedrin, when he was slapped, he pointed out the fact that God will slap you. Oh, well, how was I not supposed to know? He even apologizes for breaking the word about treating people in authority wrongly. So it's interesting that even when in those difficult situations, he doesn't try to impose. He's consistent with what he's writing here to the Romans. You don't need to do it my way. I'd like you to know who saved me so that you can be saved. And if you think I'm full of it, well, go.
Go try a relationship for yourself. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> the second idea in here uh, kind of connects to the imposing opinions on others. Because these may be more than just religious opinions. You know, we have in this tendency culture, it's like, well, I'm gluten-free, and because you're not, you're a moron. Well, I mean, if you have celiac disease, certainly, but then that's a health issue. But if it's just done as a diet, is it any different from keto? We each do it our own way. We each do it our own thing. We can learn of each other. Especially since one of the truest code ideas of how to behave that you know goes deeper than it is just why cause physical harm to each other? We shouldn't. We shouldn't be causing harm, period. But we're a broken species. Sometimes it just happens. Whether it be malice of forethought, ignorance, or just a bad day gone awry. No one's hands are clean. So why say, you know, well, my hands are clean, so you do it my way. The only hands that were ever truly clean are Christ's. The rest of us are washed white as snow by accepting his gift of salvation. And in truly embracing it, reflect it. He loves us, so we love others. He is merciful to us, so we share mercy. He shares his joy, so we brim over with it. He gives us new life, so we share it with others. He mounts us up like wings of evils, giving us new strength to run and grow no weary. Well then, we share that. We be the hand that pulls somebody out of the fire when they're reaching to come out. And the third idea here of appeasement. Well, if you're trying to please everyone, one, you can't. Because you can't please everyone. That's just a truism of human nature. You're eventually going to piss somebody off, even if it's just running across somebody who enjoys being pissed off. So, if you could never truly make anyone happy, then making them happy seems to be counter to the point. So how do we love God and love others? Because those are the three ideas here that if any one of them, the imposing your relationship with God on others, the using your opinion to say, you know, do it my way, or, or, or other ways, just trying to please everyone, if all three of these are wrong, and the true blessing is when our behavior and our belief are coherent, then perhaps it is not about the person to person, like Paul says in 17 through 18, it's about pleasing God. Because the connection with Him will set the rest right. You know, in, in the Christian belief, it is that when you put God first, everything else will line up where it's supposed to. It's a bit of a truism in the belief, because when living that consistent form of life, it proves to be true. I mean, very early into Genesis, Yahweh, Yaira, God who sees to it. And if he's seeing to it, then our focus can be something else. If he's seeing to having the relationships that we need, if he's seeing to opening the doors that need to be open and shutting the doors that need to be closed, then as we come before him in a relationship and ask and talk with him, not an autopilot thing, but an actual journey together, moving with him, letting him show us where to go, Embracing the idea of Peter walking on the water, not because of doubts about who was in the boat or the idea of the water underneath, but just, well, he said come out, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go go where he said to go. Because Peter only sank when his focus became the waves, not the one. <laughs> when his focus became the waves rather than the wave. The way, blah, 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 sorry. Because Christ is the way, the truth, and the light. And I'm not asking anyone who listens to these to take my word as the gospel truth. I'm speaking from my own experiences. I am talking as somebody who used to live a life that was completely counter to love. I'm talking as somebody who used to be a demonic little antichrist. 
that was so interested in making others suffer that it made once upon a time me giddy. And now I look back at it and I thank God for freeing me from those chains. For replacing hate and anger with love. For replacing sorrow and heartache with joy. For replacing a weary life that was done with humanity with one that wants to embrace every member of it. Good, bad, or indifferent because they're God-made. That's not something I could do. I had piles upon piles of self-help books trying to get out of it, and it never did anything. But embracing God? It did. And I'd hope everyone would. Not my form of it. Their own form. <laughs> I'm a bit of a cheeky person. I like dry wit. I like humor. I like to poke fun of literally everything. Because the only thing I honestly take serious is God. The rest of it's just an adventure in playing together. But I'm me. And if knowing that I could go from darkness to light seems interesting, won't dig in. The word's there. God is omnipresent. He's the one you need the relationship. Go dig in. Go find him. Seek and ye shall find, because he's right there. Knock and the door will be open because he wants to let you in. That's the beauty of it. We can have lives that are consistent with our behavior when we let him be the one to set the tone. I'm not preaching religion in any way, shape, or form. I hate organized religion. I find it to be too much like bureaucracy, and I believe bureaucracy is satanic. Because it does top-down. And people, you start at the bottom and work your way up. Because everybody needs to be on even level. Because we're all equal. We're all made in His image. We all need Him. So try it for yourself. Go dig in. Even if the start of your journey is embracing the idea of the Book of Lamentations, where it's going, God, WTF. And going from there. There's a reason that the three wisdom books in the Bible are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Good things happen to good people. Proverbs. Not always. Ecclesiastes. Well, what does that mean? You've got, are you good or not, God? Job. And Job, answers, or Job is answered by God when God says, I handle all of this. Everything is in my hands. I'm not picking on you. If I was only interested in causing you pain, why did I make you in the first place? It's inconsistent with who he is. So the rest of it has to come from somewhere else. People, the enemy, wherever it comes from, if we trust him to set it right, if we cultivate a relationship with the God who sees to it, then we can embrace the kind of life that Christ lived and walk with the kind of love that he has. He paid for our sins. We don't have to. Embrace that fact, because that is the only, the only part of this that I will ever be trust. Is you need Christ. You need the balance paid. Our actions have consequences. On the grand scheme, the very nature of sin isn't just a single event, it's the weave web that comes afterward. Person A steals something from person B. The sin is the theft, but person B now also has to deal with a lack of trust because of person A. Perhaps fear of losing what is theirs. Unease. Maybe even a sleepless night because of the terror. All from just the act of theft. So, if that's the kind of weave that is woven by our, a web that is woven by our actions, then something has to set it right. 
And that's what Christ has done. Come to set things right between us and God. And as we are set right with Him, He sets us right with everyone else. Two birds with one stone, 17 and 18. Your task is to single-mindedly serve Christ. Pleasing the God above you proves the worth of the people around you. Because it's not about them. It's not about them doing it your way or you guys doing it my way. None of that is the point. The point is the relationship. Not forced on anybody. Not condemning anybody. But just digging into who God is. Let our lives, our behaviors, reflect a belief that we can embrace who He is. Because He's there. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. So as I wrap up here, I would just say this. As you go through the day-to-day, and you're dealing with moments of trial and tribulation, moments where your behavior and your belief are tested, remember, you don't have to impose your relationship on others. You don't have to impose your opinion on others. And you don't have to appease others. Embrace God and see what He'll do next. I look forward to starting up tomorrow for chapter 14. I may miss Wednesday for a back injection, but we'll see. I will see you guys then. God bless, and may His favor be upon you. And remember, you are more loved than you know. See you then.